Welcome back to Comic Shop Talk. Uh, last week we talked about insurances, so I went out, I said I would try, and Mark was good enough to come by, uh, who is also a content creator, but uh, he also is an insurance agent, and he's come to talk to us about what you need to know about insurance for when you're starting your comic shop up and what you need to look for. Mark, thanks for coming out. Give us the, the name of your um, podcast. Yeah, so uh, on top of uh, being an insurance salesman, uh, I started a uh, theme parks podcast called Diz Life Podcast. It's DizLifePodcast.com. And we talk Disney, Universal, SeaWorld. Uh, and it was born of the pandemic. And, you know, here we are a few years later. Yeah, fantastic. Still doing it. It's a lot of viewers. And if you're into Disney stuff, you definitely should go check it out. Uh, but, you know, one of the guys, he's a good customer of ours and a good friend. And, uh, and one of the nerd culture. <laughs> and he's, he's here with us, right? So... Uh, what we want to talk about pretty much is what are some of the things we should ask or look for? Like, let's maybe start out with five things we can, we, we really should know about getting insurance for your business. So the type of insurance you're going to look for is called a business owner's policy or a BOP for short. A lot of carriers have it. The, they have preloaded coverages that are usually very similar across companies to BOP. And no matter what piece of paper it's written on, they're fairly standard. But for you in retail, especially in something that has uh, value that can fluctuate and things can go high market value, your, your biggest thing that you want to look for and look at is to make sure that the carrier that you're with uh, is, the, the topic is insurance to value. Some companies will only insure specific items for a set value while others will give you more bang for your buck and they may give you the full appraised value of an item. So make sure whatever company you're shopping for, you have a clear understanding of how, what they're comfortable with covering your items for because the worst part is to sign up to get a brand new policy and then only discover that, let's say we have a million dollar inventory, but that only $30,000 of that inventory or the appraised value of that inventory is gonna be covered. So that's a good conversation to have with the insurance professional who in some cases might even have to go to the underwriter and say, let me check on that. Because before you sign on a dotted line, just make sure that you're comfortable with how much the company can cover and make sure that they have the, the right appetite. Um, the other big thing that you and I talked about before we went on air is make sure that that number falls in your, your budget, obviously. Right. Right. The cost of insuring a million dollars could be astronomical depending on, again, shop the different companies. Some companies will have better rates for property coverage versus others. And that comes down to comfort. How much of that type of risk is that company on? Companies who have say thousands of retail operations might give you a better rate because they have a lot more skin in the game right. versus a company who's of just a small fraction of their, of their book of business is retail. So make sure you, one, you find out what that formula is, will they, what percentage will they insure to value, but also what the rate is right. per million. Some companies will give you a better rate, and therefore, again, you could get more bang for your buck. But those are the, the two biggest concerns for any shop owner, is making sure that your inventory is protected. Uh, because that is, if something catastrophic happens, that's what you're gonna be most concerned with. That's what's gonna get you back up and running again if there's a fire or a flood or a covered cause of loss. Yeah, and this is something that people should update as their, as their inventory changes. Like I have a lot more inventory than I had when I opened. Right, right. There's a lot of companies that'll have an endorsement as well called a seasonal increase. And they'll have it built into the policy. It's a small endorsement that during the holiday season, if you're pulling in more inventory, and if there are certain times a year that you know that your inventory is going to temporarily swell, that's a great endorsement because it'll give you a percentage that will say, you know, here's a you know, percentage up that we will go automatically without having to schedule or like really call each other. Um, that's a really great endorsement to have for, for retailers as well. Oh, very cool. So that's inventory and right. stuff for catastrophic. Um, let's now talk about a little bit about liability and if there's a difference between having sole proprietor LLC to uh, corp, uh, an S-corp or a regular LLC? 
Yeah, those are great considerations. Uh, a lot of companies will sometimes give you price advantages depending on if you are incorporated, whether you're an S Corp or a C Corp or you're a limited liability corporation versus a sole proprietor. There's a lot of other advantages to having those incorporations versus just being a sole proprietor in terms of, you know, and, and I'm not an accountant. Uh, I do speak accountant, but I'm not, <laughs> I'm not an accountant. So you would want to consult with your financial professional to see what those additional advantages are. But I, I can tell you that I have seen with my contractors and retailers, there's a great advantage to being incorporated, quite literally being the limit of that liability that would come back on you in a, in a personal capacity should there be a catastrophe at one of your, your retail locations. But most of that BOP that I talked about earlier, most of those BOPs will start with a standard of $1 million combined single limit or per occurrence. And then they'll have what's called an aggregate or, you know, so think of it as the, the way I can simplify it is you would have $1 million per accident and then $2 million per year. So let's say you did have a, you did have a catastrophic loss of a million. Relax. You got another million dollars. <laughs> you can have one more accident, one more accident. Uh, of a million dollars before your insurance was exhausted. So that portion of your insurance should not be costly. So if you find during your quoting process that when you're comparing apples to apples with companies and you find that there is one carrier out there that seems to be higher than another, a million dollars is a million dollars. And unless there are some really extreme conditions or exclusions, most of it is pretty much straightforward. It is slip and fall coverage. It's accidental coverage if someone should fall. Um, not a ton of product liability in what this, you know, um, unless someone gets their hand on the wrong kind of comic yeah. and it causes some emotional distress. <laughs> most of the time you're not, you don't need the product's liability as much as you do just kind of some kind of slip and fall, whether it's immediately upon exit or entrance into your location. But it is an important thing to have. You don't want to shirk that. Um, but most of the time, the cost when you're shopping is going to be in your in your property. Right. Now, so a local insurance agent might know better. Is there a difference from like town to town, city to city, state to state? On Absolutely. So I write insurance in the tri-state area. So I'm licensed in New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. And I could tell you, even though we're neighboring, and you can throw a baseball literally at any moment and you know hit yeah. one, one side of the, the, the rules and regulations are, are gonna differ from state to state. The paper is different in every single state. The rate is gonna be different in every single state. And you do wanna be very uh, up on what the insurance rules and regulations are for each independent state because with insurance, it's regulated at the state level. So even though I have a national producer number I have to be very aware of whatever whatever the regulations are in that state that I'm writing, and they can change, Right. and they can change. Especially when it comes to workers' compensation, which I know we're not gonna get into today. If you wanna have- I wanna touch, I do wanna yeah. touch on it just a tiny bit. They are not contained in a BOP usually. So that is gonna be a separate policy in and of itself. Is That's that only if comp. you have paid employees. So if you have employees that are not 1099, so if you have employees that are, yep. Yeah. And again, this comes down to some of those, those advantages that I know that we're gonna keep it brief today, that those LLCs have a little bit of an advantage because as a owner, you can exclude yourself on that LLC. Whereas if you were incorporated, you could not. You would technically be an employee of the, of the corporation. So depending on the states and the rules and regulations, some states are a little bit tighter with, with that than others and allowing you to exclude even yourself. Okay. These are the things to talk to your accountant about. Again, very important things to consider. Um, but the local guy, to circle back, I always, we shop local. There are, adv there are advantages. You know, people will all, you can shop and you can go online for comparative purposes, but when something goes wrong, it's great to have the guy whose office is right down the street to right. be here within a moment's notice if there's a loss or a claim to advise you, to walk you through, to calm you down. Um, but even if there's any billing questions, it's nice to have that local guy to go to because he will understand even your own inventory. Right. If he walks into the store to be able to look at it and give you the professional advice, hey, I do think you're underinsured or have you considered this gap that I've noticed? So shopping local has its advantages. Yeah, so let's talk about, about a gap. Now, where what kind of gap 
it doesn't even have to be comics. We can just speak in yeah. plain terms as what might be a gap that people don't recognize or think about. So one of the one of the gaps that people often don't recognize, there is most business owners policies have endorsements called hired and non-owned auto coverage. It's bigger in some of the food delivery services where you will be impressing your own personal vehicle into the service of this. So let's say you said to one of your employees, hey, could you take these deposits, run them down to the bank for me and put them in? You are for the, the sake of temporarily hiring that vehicle in the service of your business. Now let's say there is a hypothetical accident. The person who gets struck or injured realizes that this was somehow tethered to the business. It could always come back. So for a fairly inexpensive endorsement of 100 or $150 to get hired and non-owned, now that liability of 1 million is going to come in almost like an umbrella over that vehicle cover that and the company would say we have we have a duty to defend and we're gonna we're gonna come to your defense in terms of this automobile accident so that would be 100 or 150 a year on the pot yeah, yeah. A and it's a you, rough guess it's a rough right estimate. right right it's right. I'm, nobody's holding it to, <laughs> holding you to it but uh this is something i absolutely had no idea of my vehicle is not owned by the business it is has haven for heroes all over it has a big sticker on the back yeah. everybody knows who owns it um and I guess if if I ever was in an Great accident, endorsement. Yeah. I would probably need to have that because they would probably come figure that the business, I don't have a million on my car insurance. I think it's in New York State, I think it's 300,000. Right, and that's where those business insurance policies really work well is because the limits are much higher in terms of the coverage that you have. And the cost for that higher limit is way cheaper than if you were to raise your personal auto to a million. Yep. So I just learned something very, very important today. And I'm, in ten, I'm gonna be in business 10 years in May, and yeah, uh, that's, that's awesome. <laughs> we'll talk, we'll talk. Yeah. Um, so let's now talk about, um, again, if you can think of anything else that like, what about fixtures? Like if you do have a catastrophic, does it cover not only the inventory, but like the furniture fixtures for right. it? Right, so those things are called business personal property. And it's a great idea to not just have an inventory list, but a list of equipment, you know, cabinets, computers, because if, if there's a loss, you want to build that into whatever that coverage is too. Right. Because that's going to, again, the, the startup is not just gonna have to be the startup of, of purchasing inventory a second time, but it's gonna have to be that kind of stuff. So now does that fall under the inventory? That's gonna fall under the inventory. Under the inventory. Yep, and most, most companies do just what's called a blanket. Right. And they'll say, if, and the way I like to simplify it for my business owners, I go, okay, we just had a fire. I'm showing up tomorrow with a check. What number do you need to make you either whole or happy? Happy being that you can reopen as soon as we can get inventory and get everything painted and fixed up. Right. And that's the number that we work off. If you can support that and provide any kind of evidentiary support, whether it's an inventory list or even just, you know, hey, will this desk, call, you know, and people will write them down or create spreadsheets. I love those kind of things because it makes my job and it makes the adjuster's job very easy when we do have a claim because then we can just go right off of that list and provide you with the check very fast. Now, do I have to provide any type of coverage for outside companies that may, so like I have um, candy machine and I have a Coke thing, but I also, I used to have a lot of pinball right. and video games. Right. Um, and so was it their insurance covering it inside my building or was I, would I have to come up with insurance? That's a great, uh, it's a great practice to, if you have something that you feel is a risk, um, so f food is a perfect example. If you have a vendor and you have someone who's an independent distributor of you know, pretzels or soda, to ask them for what's called a certificate of insurance that you will hold and you'll keep in that, that in your possession and you can ask them periodically, hey, could you provide me with an updated certificate of insurance? Because if something happens born of their product, then you know immediately who you need to go to in order to settle that or what's called subrogate, that if you get sued, your insurance company will then turn around and pull their team in. 
so that you know you might be the first line of defense, but you also know that you have another insurance company that's going to back you up because it, ultimately it wasn't your fault. Right. So what, what about like um, so like I did used to have like uh, you know video game systems right. and, and such, and I'm sure that they would have insurance on their games. Would they have insurance in case their games created a fire or? So if if that should happen again, this is this is where sometimes it can get it really kind of sticky. Right? It can get a little intricate, and yeah. you'll have the, the various companies who will wrestle with with fault, right. just like they do in an automobile accident. Sure. You know, was this faulty wiring? Was it failure of the machine and components of it? All of that stuff gets hashed out. So there's no there's no true like one answer for it or, or a catch all. That's when an investigator and someone get, who gets paid way more money than I do come in and they'll make the determination. But it, regardless, I always tell people it's a really great practice to just be insured that the people that you're in business with are insured. Yeah, so the the other thing is, is that I heard that there was some lines that you could have put in that would have helped during the pandemic where you could actually for closure. Right, right. Which most people didn't have in their, their... Not many companies had it and there were there were one or two companies that did have it in the language and even they wrestled with the magnitude Dude, of how much they would pay. Of how much they were going to have to pay. Um, and the truth is, so business interruption is something that is written into many BOPs, but there are exclusions in that clause for war, famine, pit, like yada, yada, yada. So right. the companies don't blanket pay out. You know, the pandemic was the perfect example. There are a lot of companies that cover business income and replacement. And a lot of companies will do the actual loss sustained. So let's say the actual loss sustained is $50,000. Then you'll be covered up to 50,000 as long as you can prove, hey, like here, this is what I usually do a week. Yeah, here are my this books. Many weeks. Right. Yeah. And a lot of companies will set like a time limit of, up to a year of time, you know, and then beyond a year, like they will cap it. But you, that's one of those, those really great questions that you want to check with your insurance professional, see if it's afforded and what those exclusions and conditions are. No one loves reading insurance policies. It's right. like reading VCR instructions. I was just showing everybody. Mine is about the size of a, a walkthrough yeah, manual. Yeah, they're about that, they're yeah, about that it's, big. It's pretty hefty. But that's the kind of question when you got the local guy right. to ask your local guy to walk you through. And he can even walk, he'll walk you, spend the time to actually sit down. And, and that makes a lot of difference, yeah. Yeah. having a good professional. So is there is there anything that you kind of want to make sure is in your bop that sometimes they kind of leave out? or so you kind of something you have to ask for to make sure it's in there? So you might want to just check on the limits right. um, because for instance, most of them will have some kind of uh, amount for signage. But if you know that your sign is 15 or 20,000 and they only allow for five, you probably want to see what's a good way that we can up that. And most of those policies will provide you with an enumerated list of what is covered and up to what amount. So if you know that you have an area that you can see a, a vis visible gap in, just talk to your insurance professional and say, hey, this one is a little low given what I have here. What's the way that I can increase that and what would be the additional cost to do it? Is there any, uh, is there any way to kind of shuffle things around? If, if you see that something, well, I really don't need this much money for this item, can I shuffle can I lower this right. and shuffle that money there? Or is it kind of, this is their low, this is their standard? Right. Yeah, most most of those are baked in. Yeah. So they're not costing you anything additional, they're just baked into the product. Right. So you can't really shuffle those amounts it's around not about, to get the stuff you right. want. Right, it's not it's about not true a la, a la carte, right? It's not, no. Right. Yeah. You're, you kind of get this buffet of sorts of, as a business owner, here are all of the options that we afford to you at no additional cost. If you would like more of it, you know, it's like ordering the crab legs right, at right. the buffet. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to get the crab legs, but when you do, it's gonna cost, cost you a little you bit more. more. Yeah, so basically they're trying to manage risk and they know that they, giving you this much for this pot over here, this almost never happens. So giving you that amount for that, the risk is super, super low. Right. So, but this has a little bit higher risk and if, and if you want a little bit more money, you're gonna have to pony up. And what it comes down to again is knowing your inventory, knowing what level of comfort you can be at with your budget and also balancing that and counterbalancing that with what it takes to sleep at night to know that if there was a fire or a flood, especially if you have a residential risk on the second floor, always consider 
your inventory because sometimes there are things outside of your control that can affect your business and you just wanna always be very aware of that kind of stuff. And check for covered cause of loss as well. Make sure that... Let's explain what cover, sure. that means exactly. Sometimes people think that because I have insurance, everything is, could quite literally be covered when that's not true. Most companies cover cause of loss, fire, theft, wind, water, something that is a catastrophe. If something breaks down, like I always have people, the cooler, let's use the cooler as a perfect example. Right. Nothing happens to the cooler, it just breaks one day. It up and quits on you. A lot of people will be like, well, I have insurance. I'm gonna call my company and I just lost my $2,000 cooler. I would like you to replace it. And people will get very tense when I say, well, did something run into it? <laughs> was it attacked by a goat or an angry child? Like, what yeah. was it that caused it to quit? And they're like, no, nope, it's just really old. Not a covered cause of loss. I right. hate to, and, and so that would go for, let's say that you hadn't been maintaining something, let's say the heat. And, and it breaks in down. Northeast, it yes. breaks down and a water pipe bursts. And that, well, where, where, where are we in that kind of situation? So again, that's where your adjuster would come in. And what they're gonna do is they're, they're basically going to create a chain of events. If that chain of events that led to the rupture of the pipe didn't have to do with the fact of you knew that the pipe was old and potentially a hazard, then you know there there is a good likelihood that the company will cover it. Now, was the pipe exposed? There's a, a whole ton of factors. Was the pipe exposed? If it was buried into a wall, they're gonna give you a little bit of the benefit of the doubt. But if you, they go and see that there's water spots that are about eight months old, oh, yeah, yeah. and then you go, my pipe burst, <laughs> well, you might, you might not be covered in that instance. Yeah, yeah. I don't wanna get into that gray area of, again, right. as the agent, those are normally not, I, I don't like those commercials that like, the guy standing six feet of water on the television is like, you know, makes a phone call, fictitious phone, yeah. and then a guy in khaki shows up and goes, I'm here to solve all your problems. That's not, as the agent, that's not what we do. Right. We help you dissect what that document is. You helped us to lower our risk. And we analyze, yeah. Right. And we analyze what you've got going on right. and we try to match the correct coverages. Because right. there's always still risk. Like, right. it's business. It, you it's you know, yes. Uh, if you want to be an entrepreneur and you want to go out and uh, be your own boss and run your own business, it is, uh, it is risk and but you really need to mitigate as much risk as possible. And that's why we did this two, two part episode on insurance. Uh, I wanna thank Mark so much yeah. for coming out. Brother, appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Um, give us again all your socials so they can uh, check you out on uh, for the Diz, Diz Life. Yeah, so what I'm, again, not doing the wildly fun job of being an insurance <laughs> agent. Uh, I moonlight as a podcaster and content creator over at Chip and Company and they own Diz Life Podcast, and that's Diz, D-I-S, lifepodcast.com, where we're, uh, we're living, or we say, we're living our best Disney lives right. over there. Well, so the, and he's been doing a lot on the Lorcana, and I've been talking a lot about Lorcana. You should get in on the ground floor if you got a comic shop. It's a little tough right now. They're trying to work it out over there. Uh, I get gr good information from Mark. Mark, when, when he can release information, I get it first, uh, which is fantastic, but, uh, yeah, it's a good game. It's uh, profitable right now. Um, it's gonna get people in your store. Families can play it. That's the greatest thing. That's the best part. Mark's about playing it. with his daughter, and uh, we've got couples, husband and wives playing, boyfriends and girlfriends, and uh, we got a family of three or four that uh, play. So, yeah, it's a really good good game, and he has a lot of great information on that podcast about about when this comes out. We just had Ryan Miller who is one of the co-creators of Lorcana on Diz Life Podcast this past Monday. So uh, if you tune in to that episode, uh, you can hear the man who created it talk about his you know, 25 years in gaming and like where the Disney connection is from. Right. Talks about his favorite cards, his favorite colors. And he uh, gives us a little little snippet of what's coming. There's, he can't yeah, spoil he can't it. Say, he yeah. can't spoil too much, but he di I did hear that there was a little bit of, uh, you know, I could see a little bit between the lines of some of the stuff he was giving up, which he was cool. He gave us a character. 
So I, uh, we at least know like what property is going to get a little love in, right. in the third set. So. Yeah. So yeah, it's a really cool podcast. You should check it out. Uh, and definitely, uh, I think that he gave us a lot of great information about insurance. I, I, I've been in business 10 years and I just learned two or three things I need to talk to him about. <laughs> so uh, you know what I say, keep reading comics. And open a comic shop.